Yeah. <clears throat> One of our devotees uh, just had their birthday, and so we were giving them some gifts, which is fun. Um, I like seeing the, the people I care about get nice things and be successful in life and get gifts. Um, but I was thinking that sometimes, so sometimes what you want to do is pleasant. And oh, let me, I'm sorry. Just pretend I didn't say that. Sometimes what you're supposed to do is also what you want to do. And sometimes what is pleasant and enjoyable is also your duty. So you might have people, you like giving gifts to them, and it's their birthday, and you have to give them a gift, and going and buying them a gift is, is an enjoyable experience. Or maybe it's your birthday, and your loved ones want to get you a gift, and so you, that's your duty. Your duty is to sit there and receive their gift and their appreciation, and in fact, that's what you want to do. Sometimes, however, doing your duty is, uh, is not pleasant or preferred. Sometimes doing your duty consists of, it's an austerity. You know, you could imagine if you were a homemaker and you were tired and your duty was to cook for your family. And so then you had to cook for your family, although you weren't really feeling it that day. And, you know, that, that was an austerity. It wasn't something necessarily enjoyable. You follow that? So sometimes your duty is not enjoyable. Sometimes your duty is enjoyable. Usually when your duty is enjoyable, it doesn't take much to motivate or inspire you. I find with myself that I, I run into problems when doing the right thing is unpleasant or difficult and it's not in line with what I would want to do if somebody asked me. Hey, just, you know, do whatever you want to do. Anyway, these, these points, um, they, uh, they segue into different ethical theories. And there's two major ethical theories. There's a couple more, but the two I'm going to touch on now. There's a results-based ethical theory. So when you want to figure out what you should do, what you should do is what gets you the result you want. Did you follow this? Right? And so, you know, there's two ways usually you go on that either. The result you want is either uh, to achieve pleasure or the result you want is to mitigate pain. They're two different things. Like in behavioral psychology, animals will do more to stop pain than they will to achieve pleasure. There's one exception to that. They gave rats cocaine. They had made the rats run backwards and forwards across a hot metal plate, and then they would touch something over here with their snout, and they would get cocaine. And then they would have to run across to the other side, and they would get cocaine, and they would go back and forth. And they continued to heat up the plate. Do you follow? And the rats would run back and forth until they fried. with a few exceptions like that. And there's, there's ways we can adjust that. In general, behaviorism, the study of human behavior, and animal behavior for that matter, and you know, how to modify behavior, control behavior. Behavioral studies, behavioral psychology has taught us that people will do more to avoid pain than they will to achieve pleasure. So, you might say, oh, well, you, know, you want to do something which is going to mitigate pain. Well, no, better you, you shoot for something which is going to give you pleasure. But actually, mitigating pain is the winner. If you really want to motivate yourself, what usually helps you move forward is when staying the same gets to be too painful. The idea of chasing the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you know, sometimes you might have an off day. 
but you find the people who do the best, the people who are like really like phenomenal at achieving things, they have a psychology where if, if they don't win a gold medal, if they don't become champion of the world, if they don't become successful, it eats away at them and they actually undergo pain. And so in some sense, them achieving a pleasure is really more about them mitigating pain. And so when you find people who perform at an extreme level, it's usually because they have a mindset that if I don't do this and achieve this, then I'm going to suffer. Like if you look at Trump and the way he's handling his defeat in the last election, it's, it's like he can't cope. His like world's crumbling around him and you can see it, the denial and the gradual, um, the more and more erratic behavior and statements coming from him. Because, you know, to not win, I mean, you, you became like fabulously wealthy, half the country loves you more or less, and, and at least a big chunk of the country, you've got a kind of a cult-like following uh, as well, he enjoys, you know, a much smaller, but a cult-like following in some circles. And he got the highest office in the land, and, you know, and, you know has near 100 million followers on Twitter. He's, by all accounts, he's lived a successful life. He's got that horrible hairdo and a weird orange tan. But, you know, with like uh, those few things that he's got not going for him. He's obese. He's probably in a loveless marriage. There's some other stuff. But, but if, if you look at, you know, if you look at uh, his life, by all, you know, by, for all intents and purposes, he's, what, what is he, like, it's like, in terms of like most successful people across the board, like, what, where is he? If you value success in material, in material terms, a combination of fame and you know, you know, sheer popularity and, and money and, and influence. What is he like? In the top five on the planet? Maybe top ten? Think about it. But to lose his second term, it, uh, you can see it like eroding away at his basic sense of self. You know, and it becomes like a, the world is not enough type of situation. The world is not enough. You get a big black hole in your heart, and then no matter what fills it, it never lasts because your cup's got a hole in the bottom of it. So no matter how much you pour into it, it just goes right through it, and you can't hold on to anything. No matter how much love or accolade or success somebody enjoys, it's never enough. Strangely, those people who have this dysfunctional worldview tend to be incredibly successful and they're driven and they perform at a very high level because their performance isn't so much about achieving pleasure as it is about mitigating pain and quieting the voices of condemnation which stew around in the back of their head. Are you guys following me? So anyway, there's two basic ethical theories. One is you want to achieve pleasure. The other one is you want to avoid pain. And there's a results-based approach to this, where you do whatever gets you the result you want. You do whatever gets you the result you want. And this has some pretty serious consequences. A results-based ethic becomes the ends justifies the means. And it can, get, it can get pretty twisted pretty quick. For instance, for a results-based ethic, if your goal was to cause the least amount of absolute suffering possible, and you could quantify suffering. You could quantify suffering. It would make perfect moral sense. Let's say, I don't know, let's say there's like a trillion tears to cry that have to be cried in a given year. Tears of pain, tears of loss, tears of sorrow. So there's a trillion tears that need to be cried in a given year. You follow? Now somebody said to you, well, I'll cut that to 500 billion tears. I'll cut the amount of suffering in the world in half. But we're going to have one person experience all that pain. From a results-based ethic, with no other factors in the equation, just looking at sheer suffering, it would make perfect moral sense to take a deal where one person suffered on behalf of the entire world if the absolute amount of suffering that had been quantified was less. Did you guys follow that? 
But that doesn't make sense. That doesn't seem fair. You shouldn't have to cry tears for someone else. So we need to add other factors in. That have to be, you deserve the amount of suffering that's due to you, and you shouldn't have to suffer for somebody else. And you you put other things in. You know now. You know, for instance, like let's say one person, let's say five people were going to get uh, run over by a train, and you could press a button, and the train would move off the track, and only one person would be killed. Do you do it? You trade five lives for one life. Do you do it? It's an interesting question. It's kind of a standard question you ask if you take a college ethics class. It's kind of a, one of the thought experiments they have you do to think through your moral, your moral theory. Um, if you do it, you just commit a murder. That one guy wasn't going to get killed. The other five were. You got involved and you killed one to save five. Then what if the one was your friend and the five were strangers? You need to get into stuff. Then, okay, well, I wouldn't press the button. Okay, but what if you just don't press the button at all? What if the person gets killed unless you press the button? You follow? So now it's not a question of, like, you got to press the button. It's a question of if you don't press the button and, like, the thing changes. And you can play games like this. What would you do? What would you not do? If you press a button, you might as well be willing to push the guy off a bridge. Would you be willing to push a guy off a bridge to his death? To save the lives of five people. No, well, that's what pressing the button equates to, though. And so you've got to think through your moral theory. So anyway, when you get into a results-based ethics, which is, called, which, is a, uh, which is hedonism or utilitarianism, positive bringing pleasure to people, either, it can be either for yourself or for everybody. So it's, it's, it's called utilitarianism, positive utilitarianism, hedonism. These are, these are all words for this idea of increasing pleasure. And then you have the idea of mitigating pain, which is called negative utilitarianism. Um, and that can be for minimizing your own pain or minimizing others' pain. Amazingly, the mindset where your success in life is driven to quieting the voices of like, pain and condemnation in your head is what leads people to achieve the biggest things. Because we do more to get rid of pain than we do to, uh, to achieve pleasure. If you're ever running or lifting weights or doing something where there's a possibility of you giving up, David Blaine used to do this when he was training himself. David Blaine is a um, kind of a Houdini-style guy, holds his breath for 20 minutes, crazy stuff like that, like just kind of insane stuff like that. So when he would train, you know, you, it's, how do you train yourself to hold your breath and slow down your pulse for, you know, 15, 20 minutes at a time? He would tell himself, my whole family's going to be killed unless I hold my breath. My whole family's going to be killed unless I run. My whole family's going to be killed unless I lift this weight. He would create that scenario in his head, which essentially is a negative utilitarian model of minimizing suffering. Why? Because that's what motivates people to work. That's what behaviorism has taught us, with the exception of the cocaine thing I mentioned. And you could say addiction is such that it makes life without the drug painful. So it's not like you, you, you can still philosophize your way around that. You guys following me so far? Yeah? You follow me? All right. Okay. Then you have a duty-based ethic, which is called deontology or a deontological ethic. And so a duty-based ethic is that you find out what your duty is. That's the big thing you got to figure out. The other one is you figure out what's painful or pleasurable. You deal with that. And then you got to factor in variables so that it doesn't become where you could give unlimited pain to one person. You got to factor in what are the rules of the game in terms of doling out that pain or pleasure, minimizing that pain or doling out that pleasure. Um, in a duty-based ethic, the real thing you've got to figure out is what is my duty. And then you stop caring about the result and you do the right thing. You guys follow this? Okay. Now I'm going to tie it into what I said initially. So please listen, because I don't think I'm speaking incoherently, but I am covering a number of topics. 
and I don't have enough time to delve into each one of them in detail. So I'll be coherent, but you guys bring your A game. Here we go. It's easy to do your duty when it's what you want to do anyways. It's easy to buy a gift for a loved one for their birthday when you enjoy doing such things. It's easy to receive a gift when you enjoy doing such things. The problem is when doing your duty becomes unpleasant. That's where the rubber meets the road, and that's the test. For instance, for instance, if your duty is to, min if your goal in a results-based ethic is to create pleasure for many people, but you have to suffer to some extent, or mitigate, or attenuate, or circumscribe, or lessen your own pleasure to bring more like a bunch of pleasure to a bunch of other people, then you find, the, you find that experience of lessening your own pleasure to contribute to the pleasure of other people, that may make it difficult. That may make it difficult. Usually when you get in arguments, like with couples or with you know, uh, two friends even, in a platonic relationship, Oftentimes, the debate will be about, you know, what's fair to each party. And, you know, are they taking your thought, feelings and thoughts into consideration? And are they being reasonable to you? Or are they being selfish? It's, it's a huge topic. And it's really what destroys relationships is when you feel like the other person is taking advantage of you or doesn't care about you and your, own, and your happiness or the lessening of your suffering. But that's when it gets difficult. When getting a good result requires some pain, even if it's for yourself. Let's say you want to get in shape. That's a result that's based on yourself. But it requires you to undergo some pain in the interim period. That's tough. That's why diets don't last. That's why workout programs don't last. That's why people have problems. I mean, we're like, we're, are, you, know, you, know, you're, you know you're 48% more likely to die of COVID if you're fat? Obese, like actually obese. Did you guys know that? It's crazy, right? Being obese, not only does it take 10, 20 years off your life, but in, in a situation like the pandemic we're dealing with, it compromises your immune system, makes you way less likely to be able to fight off the disease. But people are, you know, they're so addicted to stuffing stuff in their mouth and swallowing. It's not actually, you might think, oh, I'll just put some food in my mouth and chew it and then spit it out. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The, we're addicted to chewing food and tasting it, but part of that process is also the swallowing of it. It's also swallowing it. Ghrelin is the chemical in your body that stimulates hunger. and Unless you swallow the food, the ghrelin doesn't get satisfied. You have this feeling of like, I'm hungry, I'm starving, I need to eat. Um, so anyway, um, when your pleasure for a period of time is minimized, even if it's to get you a greater pleasure, when your pleasure is minimized to give others pleasure, when the thing is painful for you in a results-based ethical model, that's when you start to get challenged. When creating pleasure requires some pain to be endured, either for the greater collective pleasure or for your own ultimate pleasure. Similarly, in a duty-based ethic, doing your duty when it's personally inconvenient and difficult, it starts to erode away at your willingness to do your duty. You might have a sense of what your duty is, but then when there's pain attached to it, you start to rethink your duty. Maybe that's not my duty. You follow? All right, I have a verse today, and then, and then we'll keep going. I got a verse I want to introduce. The verse is, Tazmatvam utishta yasho labhasva mungta rajasam hridham na maivaite niyatam sapurvam eva nimita matram bhava savya sachin. We're into our texts in their original language. 
or into understanding our texts in their original language. So, tazmat, therefore, tvam utishta, tvam means you, utishta, get up. There's a verse in the Gita. Krishna's talking to Arjuna. Therefore, you get up. He's instructing him, get up. He's using what's called imperative language, something that you rarely see in the Gita. Do this. Normally, Krishna says, if you do this, then this will happen. It's more of conditional statements where he's not telling you what to do, but he's just explaining the ramifications or the repercussions of an action. In this instance, he orders Arjuna to get up. Yasho Labhasva, gain fame, achieve fame. Like Yashoda means the one who gives fame. Yasho Labhasva, gain fame. Punktarajam Samhridham, enjoy a flourishing kingdom. Get up, gain fame, enjoy a flourishing kingdom. Doesn't sound like a bad verse, right? Problem is what getting up means in this context. Getting up in this context, Arjuna was a warrior on the battlefield. He was protecting the innocent. He was protecting them from a catastrophic genocide. And somehow or other, that day, his family members all joined the bad guy's side and were part of the villain team. And so Arjuna was going to have to fight to defend his family, uh, defend the world. And to defend the world, he was going to have to kill his family members. So getting up consisted of killing others. And not just killing others, killing his family members. You see how all of a sudden the train example starts to make a bit more sense? I'm doing that math. Maivaite niyatam sapurvam. They've already been killed by me. They've already been killed by me. Does that indicate determinism? Do you guys know what determinism is? It means that everything which happens is fated to happen. Now, there's a pretty big problem with determinism. Strong determinism, that everything is fated to happen, nullifies free will. Did you follow that? In a strong deterministic world, free will is an illusion. If there's a God in your theory, and you have a strongly deterministic view of the world, then all suffering and evil are God's fault. Did you follow that? So clearly, they've already been killed by me, and Krishna's speaking, Def is definitely deterministic, correct? But an important distinction should be made. It's not necessarily absolutely deterministic. Did you guys follow that? Doesn't mean that everything that ever happened was determined and you had no free will. That would be a strong determinism or an absolute determinism. But if you have free will and then you jump off a building, and while you're floating in the air, I go for sure he's going to break his legs. If I take a snapshot, as you're floating through the air, and I say for sure he's going to break his legs. You jump off, let's say, a three-story building where breaking your legs is guaranteed. Four stories. Let's go four stories. Over seven or eight, you're toast. You're dead. Three, four stories, you're breaking legs for sure. So I say to you, you jump off a building of your own free volition, and on your way down, we press pause on the universe, and I get to do a voiceover on the universe. And I say, Yoga, that's his name, is going to his birth name. Yoga, is your full name Yoga? Yogananda. Yogananda, the bliss of yoga, the happiness of yoga. So um, I say, Yogananda 
is going to break his leg because he's an idiot. He jumps out the building like a moron. Of course, if the building's on fire, maybe you weren't a moron. Maybe you're just like really brave. Um, or if there's some person being injured on the ground and you're jumping to their rescue, you thought you were going to be able to crawl over there and help them, then it might be a brave thing to do. But if I we press pause on the universe and I say, hey, Yogananda is going to break his legs, that indicates that at the time I made that statement, his breaking his legs is deterministic. Did you follow this? Does that mean that everything that ever happened isn't your fault? No. So if, I, if Krishna says, I have already killed them, it's certainly deterministic. It's not necessarily strongly deterministic, because if those people who were being killed had done something of their own free volition to deserve that, and we were just taking a snapshot of what their karma was in the world that was caused by them, then you still got room for free will, and not all evil and suffering gets thrust on God's shoulders. Did you follow that? I'm speaking clearly, but I'm moving at an intermediate pace, so you guys got to keep up. You got it now? Yeah. All right. So the verse is certainly deterministic. They've already been killed by me. That's literally what Krishna says. Maya, Maya, Eva. Maya means by me. Eva, Ete, these, these warriors. Niyatam, Sapurvam, Eva. They've already been killed by me. Purva means previously, Niyatam means killed. They've already been killed by me. Get up, become famous, enjoy a flourish team. You're like, hey, you don't have to threaten me with a good time. Like, I'm all in, right? Oh, but when I say get up, I mean go kill your family members and protect the innocent. Now that good thing has some pain attached, and now all of a sudden I don't know what I want to do. And then Krishna says, Mai vaite niyatam sapurva meva. Nimita matram. Only an instrument. Bhava savya bhava savya sachin. Only be an instrument. Oh, ambidextrous one, ambidextrous archer. Arjuna was an ambidextrous archer, so he's referred to as such. Savya Sachi. It, it indicates that Arjuna had honed himself so he could be an instrument. He had undergone a period of training so he could be an instrument. And now his duty in life was to engage in a holy war at Krishna's behest and kill even his own family members to stop a mass genocide. Genocides are automatically mass by their very definition. A horrific genocide. You follow? I use the word holy war because a holy war is a theocratically endorsed war. A war approved of by God. And normally we use that in the context of radical Islam, Islamism and and it's like really bad. It's got no place in Hinduism. But if you look at the context of the Gita, it was a war. The war was logical. It was reasonable. And therefore, it was also endorsed by God. If God's logical, and there's a good reason to believe God's logical, we see that the world, the universe that we live in, follows rules, such as gravity and entropy, for instance. So it makes perfect sense to believe that the world cause of the world is also logical. That's actually behind any science, is the idea that if you can understand the patterns and the causes, then those causes will reliably result in, 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 in guaranteed, repeatable results that can be measured. An experiment can be repeated, because when these preconditions are there, then logically, automatically, these results will be there. If you live in such a world, it would make sense that the source of that world, or the original governing principles of that world, or the singularity that world comes from, also follows such logic. Anyway, so Arjuna's battle made sense because he was minimizing the suffering of many, and he was protecting the innocent, just like we're allowed to take away your freedom if your pursuit of happiness 
encroaches upon the life and liberty of others in this country. That's in the Constitution. It's enshrined in our Constitution. That we can limit your freedom if and when your freedom gets in the way of the life and liberty of other people. That's how it works. So, where things get problematic is when doing the right thing involves you undergoing some suffering, either for a time or in a certain context. You have to make a change that is not enjoyable for you. And that's when our dedication to doing the right thing gets tested. And it gets tested whether you use a results-based ethic or a duty-based ethic. It gets tested when the greater good and happiness of people creates unpleasantness for you, or the greater good for yourself creates some temporary unpleasantness for you, or minimizing suffering of others involves you undergoing some suffering, or long-term minimizing your suffering involves you undergoing some temporary suffering. And it's also true in a duty-based ethic when you arrive at what your duty is, but that duty involves you doing something which is unpleasant for whatever reason. You guys follow me? So I guess what I want to say today was this. I think there is a telos, a purpose in the universe. I think the universe has a purpose. I think all of us individually also have a purpose. Mark Twain is famous for saying the most important day of your life after your birth is the day you find out why you were born. What is it that you have to do in this world? Connecting with your God-given talents and turning that into a mission and what you were on this earth to do is the single greatest ingredient to human happiness. And it's not just me saying that. Positive psychology has taught us the same. Purpose exists. We do not live in a chaotic world. If you think we live in a chaotic world, look at the structure of the universe, and you'll see it's very ordered, and it makes perfect sense. And therefore, there's no reason to think we live in a chaotic world. Rather, it seems we live in a world where there are principles, and those principles need to be observed in order for success to occur. So we need to figure out what our duty is. And I think, for the most part, that understanding what your duty is is not the problem. I think the problem is when doing your duty is unpleasant for you, for any of the reasons I just mentioned. I try to look at it from like most of the ethical models that people follow. We're always going to run into this. We're doing the right thing. However we conceive of the right thing is painful. However we conceive of pain. Do you guys follow this? Now, a great way to still do your duty is to understand that the pain of not doing your duty and feeling that pain of doing your duty is greater than the pain of doing your duty. The pain of staying obese and dying way sooner and, and having you know, uh, all sorts of uh, concomitant health problems and having diabetes and losing your legs and setting a terrible example for your kids, when that pain weighs on you sufficiently, and then you change. When the pain of staying the same is too much, then you move. And so I, I think there is a value in deeply reflecting on like what is the ramifications of, 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 of staying the same, of not moving forward, of continuing to live with your dysfunctional patterns. I think there's a lot of value in that. It steals you and inspires you and gives you strength to walk the razor's edge and move forward. This reflection that I don't want to stay the same. And if I do stay the same, it's, 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 it's a tragedy. I do think there's value in that. I just, the point I was trying to make initially is that I don't think our problem is understanding what our duty is. I think our problem is having enough resolve and having enough courage and having enough commitment and having enough determination to actually do what you're supposed to do. 
I do not think it's difficult to figure out what you're supposed to do for anybody. Certainly, it has never been for me. It has never been a huge obstacle in my life to figure out what I'm supposed to do. It has many times been an obstacle in my life to come up with the resolve to actually carry through and do the right thing. I don't mind doing the right thing when it's easy. I don't mind doing the right thing when it's minimally difficult. But when doing the right thing is downright painful, then I start to rethink what the right thing is. And I'm not so sure if that's like, if that's the right thing. And maybe I'm being, you know, um, obstinate or I'm not seeing things, you know, from a 360 enough perspective. And I should be a little more broad minded. And I come up with all sorts of ways to talk myself out of doing my duty. But I've got some really good teachers and some really good mentors. And, and our scriptures are so filled with wisdom that understanding what my duty is has never been too difficult. Finding truth has never been difficult. Obeying that truth and being faithful to that truth and being loyal and chaste and committed to that truth, that's always been rough. You follow? I've got more, but I'm going to recap for you guys real quick. It's a good way of testing myself and just buttons it up. So if you haven't quite followed my pace and my cadence and my flow of thought, if you're able to follow everything I'm about to say and I don't mess it up, then you'll be up to date. You'll be up to speed. So here we go. Doing the right thing is easy when the right thing is what you want to do anyway. There's different ethical theories. Two of the main ones are a results-based ethic, where you do whatever gets you what you want, or you do whatever avoids what you don't want. And then a duty-based ethic, where you figure out that enigmatic term duty and what that is, collectively and individually. And then you dedicate yourself to doing your duty, irrespective of the results. One is based on the result, the other one is based on duty. One place of primacy on the result, the other place of primacy on duty. In any of those models, positive or negative, collective or individual, the real problem always arises when there's some difficulty for yourself in doing the right thing, however you determine what the right thing is. One way to deal with that is to conceive of the pain of not doing the right thing as being greater than the pain of doing the right thing, which is in a sense, you know, uh, feeding the beast, so to speak. It's acknowledging your base materialism and egocentricity and commitment to what you enjoy, and it's point, trying to point out to you that, hey, this isn't in your best interest. Like if you have to counsel a sociopath and you tell them, hey, you shouldn't stab your cellmate in the eyes for using all the toilet paper. And he's like, why not? Like, well, because then we'll take away your TV time. It's like, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> You're able to counsel them. We have to counsel them on what's, what's in it for them. Some of you can do a little business. You're going to regret this if you don't do the right thing. And I threw in some, like, bells and whistles about Trump and dysfunctional childhoods and black holes in your heart and the most driven people in the world and what, what drives them. I, I gave you guys some, like, a little bit of fodder given the election for you guys to ruminate on a bit. And then I brought up the idea that there is actually a purpose for you. I didn't give too much evidence for how we can arrive at that other than that the universe is orderly and structured. I don't want to try to make a super rigorous argument for purpose or telos or dharma in the world for each individual. But we certainly have seen that when you take your God-given talents and you use them for a higher purpose and you become dedicated to it, it's the single most important ingredient in human happiness according to positive psychology. So whether we say it's the most important thing or it's super important or whether that, whether that, um, that, that duty is purely objective, meaning that no matter what you think, there's one and only one duty you should follow, or whether that duty may have some subjectivity to it that what you want to do also can be factored into the equation. 
like in a mixed economy, you have certain free market principles and certain guided principles, and they work together cohesively. Most economies in this world today are not purely socialist, or they're not purely uh, um, predetermined, and they're also not purely free market, but there's a mix of both things that, 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 that coexist together. Uh, similarly, you know, we can think about determining what your duty is and, and what you were put on this earth to do as you're involved in that process and there's also some objective criteria. And then I said, I don't actually think it's so difficult to figure out what your duty is. I do think the problem arises when you don't want to do it and then you go back into your brain and you try to convince yourself that it's not really your duty after all because you don't want to do it and so you try to but if you look at what's motivating that, let's look at it again and do the math again. It's because you don't want to do it. And if you're honest with yourself, you'll be able to see that very clearly. Viktor Frankl one time said, before you judge somebody, ask yourself in a deeply honest way, if I was in the same situation, would I have done the same thing? So if you're really honest with yourself, at least for myself, I don't know about you guys, but for me, the confusion isn't there. I remember when I was 15, 16, 15, I remember praying on a mountaintop when I was 15, please, creator, I think I was calling God the creator at that time, please, oh creator, tell me what my path is and I promise you I'll like spend every moment of my life following it. I made that prayer. Like at 15, I thought I was so advanced. I never pray like that, ever anymore. I'm 48. So 33 years later, I never pray like that. I pray all the time, please, Krishna, help me stay the path. Please help me stay the course. Please help me do the right thing. Please help me keep my commitment to you, that promise I made so many years ago, the promises I made so many years ago. Please help me always do the right thing. Please help me live my life to make you happy. I, I pray like that all the time. But I don't pray, I'm just ignorant. And if I knew, that's the, that's the missing link. That's no longer the X factor in the equation of my life. You follow? The X factor, the variable, the, is my own sincerity and the willingness to do what needs to be done. And I never seem to have a hard time doing what needs to be done when when it's pleasant, <laughs> then it's like, you know, it never really, like if somebody wants to tell me, like people tell me all the time, like they, they appreciate me more than I deserve. I never get like super bent out of shape because they're appreciating me more than I deserve. I'm never like, you're like, it's causing me pain. It's like nails on a chalkboard. I'm like totally disturbed that you like have some excessive love for me. It just doesn't happen. But when people want to blame me for stuff, I don't deserve to be blamed for, and they want to criticize me in a way which is really unfair and unjust, then somehow or other I get all bent out of shape. You follow? If I'm honest. So, I want to put all this together and make a point to you guys today. This month, which is a holy month for us, the ritual we're going to do, which involves offering a candle to Krishna as a baby. There's actually a method to the madness. We think that in addition to having a general, excuse me, we think that in addition to having a general purpose in life, excuse me, we think that in addition to having a personal purpose in life, that is specific and individual just to you. We also think that all human beings have a general purpose in life. And that general purpose, simply put, is to love God. By loving God, you automatically love everybody else. Just like by connecting to the spo the, 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 a spoke to the hub of the wheel, it's all automatically connected to all the other spokes. So our love for Krishna entails automatically as a byproduct if we love one thing, we love all things. We think the purpose of human life is to love God. Animal life purpose isn't to love God. You know why? 
because animals can't conceive of God properly. One of the reasons is they don't have language. They don't have recursive language, and so they can't put together sophisticated ideas like the idea of God. How do we know that? Because we study animals, and we see absolutely no indication of it. I mean, animals are for other stuff. Like if you look at like a leopard, you can see, oh, that's, that animal's made to move really fast. That animal's made to rip other animals apart with its claws and its teeth. But when we look at us, we got no claws. We got no really gnarly teeth. We don't have enough hair on our body. We got to wear clothes. It's like Armageddon because it's 50 and it's a little windy here. And so when we look at ourselves, we're not like we're not put together real well. But we do have these really big brains and this incredibly powerful recursive language which is responsible for our minds because we think in language. And therefore language is incredibly potent because our language is exactly synonymous and tantamount to and equivalent to our mind. I always felt stupefied when I was living in Mexico because I have a very limited vocabulary in Spanish. But if you live somewhere for long enough, you start to think in that language. But I have a really extensive vocabulary in English. But I have a really limited vocabulary in Mexico, in Spanish, excuse me. And so when I'm living in Mexico and I'm starting to think in Spanish, I felt stupid because I couldn't think with all the words I wanted. And therefore my thoughts were not as deep as they are when I think in my native tongue. Language and thought are intimately linked. Anyway, so in addition to having a specific reason, a raison d'etre, a reason for your existence, which you should discover as quickly as possible and then dedicate your life to it. And you'll be happy. And you'll, be able to, like, you know, you'll work every day and never work a day in your life. In addition to that, there's also a general dharma of everyone. And that's to love Krishna. And I'm using the word Krishna in a very obtuse way to mean God. And so the purpose of life is to love Krishna. By loving Krishna, automatically you love everybody else, and you love the singularity, and it's the perfection of our thought, and that's what we're put on this earth to do. And I gave a little evidence for that. <clears throat> and when you talk about loving God, then automatically you have to ask somebody, what's your conception of God? So you'll know what to love. And so our conception is that God's a child. Why is God a child? Because when you love a child, you stop asking what they can do for you and looking to your own self-interest, and you start asking what you can do for them. Therefore, we love God as a child. And we love God being bound. If you look at the image on the altar, Krishna's being bound up by his angel. And why is Krishna being bound up by his angel? Because Krishna is bindable by love, and through love, we can come to know the unknowable, touch and embrace the untouchable, see the inconceivable. And so love has the power to bring Krishna powerfully in front of us. And as such, we consider that Prem has the ability to subjugate or control or bind Krishna. And when the devotee binds Krishna in their heart through love, even though Krishna's already living there, but when that Krishna becomes present to that devotee through the bonds of love, we consider that to be perfection. That's the opportunity this human form of life affords you. Now what you can do is you can use some of the tricks I gave you throughout the class you can think, if I lose this opportunity, if I fail in this opportunity, no matter what I achieve in life will be a failure. This sounds like the most amazing thing. 
and therefore if I don't achieve this, my life will be a failure, and for that reason I will chant my rounds every day. For that reason I will follow my vows every day. For that reason I will undergo whatever austerity I need to undergo to do the right thing. I'll give up whatever I need to give up. I'll grab a hold of whatever I need to grab a hold of. I have a true north pointing compass, and I'm going to navigate through, step over, work around, go underneath, blast through, ignore, tolerate, deal with, figure out whatever I need to do in this life to keep my commitment to that reason for existence that is the reason for everybody's existence. Ultimately, even the reason for the animal's existence. Why? Because they'll evolve and become human beings in some incarnation, and then they'll have the opportunity to love God. And so it's really the purpose of the existence of the entire universe. We just won the lottery. Out of all the species of animals and all the trillions and quadrillions of living entities on the planet, we've got the ability to really deeply think about the nature of reality, the nature of the creator of this world, our ability to connect with that creator, how to do that best, how to live a life in accordance with that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're so fortunate. So what I want to do to wrap it all up is I wanted to introduce the idea that what stops us from doing the right thing is not ignorance, it's weakness. And the cure for weakness is to have a burning yes in your life which is powerful enough that it allows you to move forward and allows you to like do whatever needs to be done. And that burning yes, you can even flip it and you can make it, I don't want to waste another life. I've wasted too much time already. I couldn't bear it if I wasted this opportunity. I feel great remorse for having wasted so much of my life and so many opportunities. I will not waste another one. And both positively and negatively, achieving pleasure, giving up pain, greatest good, greatest number of people, minimizing suffering for the greatest amount of people, doing your duty or trying to get a result, however you want to play the game, you can use this idea and you can plug it into whatever your worldview is, whatever your theory is, whatever your ethic is, whatever makes you tick, and you can use this to your advantage and help you walk the razor's edge that is spiritual life. And that's the deep meaning of this verse. Krishna's telling Arjuna, like, it's already done. It's all set up. This is what your duty is. But that doesn't necessarily make it easier. It's not like Arjuna heard that verse and heard all the bells and whistles he was going to get. He's like, okay, no problem. I'm going to gain fame? No, I don't want to kill my family members, even if they've done something horrible and I need to step to them. Well, you're going to enjoy a flourishing kingdom. Yeah, it doesn't matter to me either. I already told you in the first chapter, I didn't care about those things. And so, step one is like, what's my duty? And But step two is actually having the resolve to do it and the commitment to do it. And I think that's what we need to spend most of our time meditating on. That's what we need to dedicate ourselves to. That's where we need to do the most work. Not necessarily in figuring out what our duty is, but in having the wherewithal and the resolve and the patience and the enthusiasm and the commitment and the perseverance and the tolerance and the burning yes and the burning no not again not one more minute on all of that this is the ingredient this is the key I want to love God in a radically intimate and romantic way this human form of life has allowed me to conceive of God as the ultimate lover, and falling in love with God is why I'm here. And I'm going to give up what I need to give up. Probably I'll be able to get married and have a family. Probably I'll be able to be successful. But one thing's for sure, I'm not going to sacrifice the most important thing for the least important thing. And you look at people, you know, and people are into politics, and like they live and die with politics, and like that's like the most important thing in the world, and it's just so pathetic. And you look at people, and they get dedicated to all the isms in the world, and like all the various like wonderful causes in the world, and they think that's the most important thing. 
But it's really only the most important thing if you're an atheist. As soon as you introduce spirituality and a creator into the equation, there's only one important thing in this world that is so far above everything else. One of my gurus, he drew a picture. He used to like, like, like to draw very simple pictures in his writings. And so he drew a really amateurish picture. It was a, it was a circle. And it said me in it. And then they had a bunch of small circles around it. Krishna, my family, my friends, my community, my career, my hobbies, my body and mind. You follow? He said, that's how I look at the world. There's me, and there's all these important things in the world. And I have to juggle them all. And they're like moons that surround the planet of myself. And then on the next page, he said, this is what the world actually is. And there's a big circle, and it said Krishna. <laughs> and there's a small circle next to it, and it said me. That's the proper way to look at the world. There's only one thing I actually need to do here. I need to love Krishna. There's only one thing I need to do here. I need to see Krishna. There's only one thing I need to do while I'm here. I need to touch Krishna. Everything else can come or go. Hell can freeze over. Heaven can burn. None of it really matters. Sharia law can get enforced all over the world. Trump can win 87 more terms. Biden can end up being the Antichrist. Biden can be Jesus reincarnated in the Messiah. Just none of it actually matters. What does matter is figuring out why you were put here. And there's a small answer to that, and that's how to use your God-given talents to do something beneficial in the world. But then there's a big reason why you were put here. And the big reason you were put here is to love Krishna. And the sooner we wrap our heads around that reality and chasten our light to that reality and anchor ourselves to that reality, the sooner we begin to live a real life of worth. And all the various isms only make sense if you're, just, if you're an atheist. But once you introduce God and the soul and spirituality and eternity into the equation, the only thing that ultimately matters is our relationship with God. And that's not antinomianism. That doesn't mean you can just be a horrible person, kill small children in foreign countries. Because God is logical and reasonable, then you can also live a good life in this world, and that's also going to bring you closer to Krishna. But just living a good life in this world is not necessarily going to bring you close to Krishna. You have to live your life in this world sculpted in such a way where you're always moving towards Krishna. And that changes the game. Your moves become much more surgical and purposeful. When you talk to a serious athlete, their diet, their sleep schedule, their romantic life, where they live, where they train, the kind of supplements they take, the kind of diet they eat, the kind of coaches they have, what they spend their time doing, it's all carefully accounted for because they have some amazing thing they want to do, like jump high in the air and put a ball into a hoop. Or they want to like hit a ball with a stick, which is like a bunch of other sports. Or they want to like throw a ball in a particular way. Or they like want to swim backwards and forwards in a pool. Or they want to like run really fast. Some really important stuff. So we should like get their posters on our wall and worship them for all <laughs> intents and purposes. But their whole life is governed by that. We should be professional lovers of Krishna. That should be what we do. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Mere Christianity. He wrote a, book, a series of books called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Very famous books. But he wrote a book called Mere Christianity. And the, the, the thrust of the book was that he was sick of meeting Christian philanthropists and Christian industrialists and Christian professors and Christian doctors. He said, I just want to meet somebody who's merely Christian. Not where what they really are is some other thing. And Christian becomes an adjective that modifies. It's the small thing instead of the big thing. But what they are is they're just a Christian. They're merely Christian. And that's their entire existence. We should try to be merely a Vaishnava, merely a devotee, merely a lover of God. And this month is a month for us to reflect on those lessons. We have a ritual. We have a conception of divinity. They come into the forefront of our consciousness during this month, and we think about who God is, 
how intimately available Krishna is, how easily achievable Krishna is, how close Krishna is, although he may seem very far away. And we strive for that connection so that we have the strength and the courage to let go of the lesser thing. That's a whole other class on the importance of positive spiritual attainment to give you the strength to, in a significant way, move beyond mere materialism. But we'll save that for another day. Um, I think we're done. Um, so we can say goodbye to people on Instagram. Thank you very much. Rukta. <laughs>